So it's great to see you all here. And this is our third um, Ocean Data Factory webinar. Yeah. And let me first introduce the topic of today and our speaker. So the topic today, as you see on the screen, is using AI and citizen science to review the secret of seabirds. And we have our speaker, Dr. Jonas Sundberg. He is an associate senior lecturer at the Department of Aquatic Resources, Swedish University of Agriculture Sciences. Sciences. He has performed field research on seabirds for the last 20 years. So he's really an expert in this area. In 2008, he led the construction of the Castle Oak Lab. This is the world's largest nest box with space for 600 pairs of breeding seabirds. And the lab facilitates the use of an increasing number of technology systems for automated seabird observations. And this research is performed with Stockholm University, Worldwide Fund for Nature, and AI Innovation of Sweden, along with a number of other technology companies. So seabirds, they are kind of special. They are the top predators in ocean ecosystems. It's worthwhile to investigate their life habits, yeah, their habitats, and help us to better understand our ecosystems. And it's the honor of ODF to organize such webinars. And I just explain, introduce ODF a bit. Um, I saw some of you who are the new faces. It's really great seeing you here. So ODF, Ocean Data Factory Sweden, um, our purpose, our mission is to enable data-driven innovation by both commercial and non-commercial actors to ensure the ocean and its resources are managed in the best possible and most sustainable way. And we actually join also our own in-house innovation projects such as the Coaster Challenge. And we predict, for example, the invasive species like the killer shrimp. And also now we are working on the project analyzing, predicting algae blooms, yeah. This webinar series are one of the endeavors of ODF, and we hope to bring people together who are interested in ocean relevant problems, data science, citizen science, creating such a hub. So it's really great seeing all of you here today. May I, may I ask just who is new to ODF? Like the first time you, you hear about ODF, Ocean Data Factory. Mm. And you are welcome to read more about what we are doing yeah, on this webpage link, okay? So without further delay, and let's welcome Jonas. Thank you, Jonas. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. An honor to be uh, presenting for you today. Um, my name is Jonas Hentati Sandberg, as, as, uh, as Rulidi said, and I'll talk about seabirds today. And, and seabirds is a quite diverse group of animals that exist throughout the world's oceans. There are 358 species of seabirds in the world today that forms a quite important part of the ocean biodiversity and a quite unique part of ocean biodiversity because they link land and the oceans. So they spend most of their lives out in the sea, far off the coast, but importantly, every year or every second year, they have to come to land to nest. And by studying them, by getting to know them, we can learn a lot about the ocean ecosystems without necessarily going out far uh, into the ocean. And this is just a, some a few examples, eight examples of, of some of the amazing diversity of seabirds that exists uh, of the world today. You can start here with the emperor penguin. That's the heaviest of all seabirds. It can go up to 45 kilograms. And being big is very good when you want to dive deep because it's easier to swim on the water if you just don't float too much. So you can dive down and they can keep a lot of oxygen as well 
uh, within them. So you can dive down to 500, over 500 meters. Uh, another remarkable species here is the wandering albatross down to the, to the, to the right, which is the bird with the longest wingspan of all birds on Earth, about 3.6 meters. And they can, can, when it's windy, they can commute over many thousands of kilometers without spending almost any energy at all. They're using their unique wings to, to soar over the water surface. But then there are these really small species like storm petrels here. One of, it's only uh, something like 20 grams compared to many kilos of penguins. Puffins, this is the blue-footed booby up to the right. Um, we have a petrel, we have kitty wakes, uh, there are seabirds, and, and many, many other species uh, around the world. But this talk will actually not be on all types of seabirds. I will talk about one uh, specific species that is called the common myr, uh, in Swedish, the silgrisla, or sometimes called the penguin of the Baltic Sea, although uh, everyone who's a biologist, and maybe most of you who are not biologists, would know that this is not a true penguin, but they share many of the um, skills that the penguin has. They are very good at diving. They're a group, part of a group called the auks, that is sort of the penguins of the northern hemisphere. So penguins you will find only in the Antarctica and areas around Antarctica whereas the auks are the northern hemisphere counterparts. And there are many species of this group. This is the little auk, this is the razorbill. And actually we had, we used to have one species that was even more similar to, to um, uh, penguins. That was the great auk that couldn't fly actually and just swam and were really good divers. But unfortunately they were uh, killed by, uh, by hunters and fishers and some scientists as well. So the last one was killed in 1864, unfortunately. But they were breeding also around the whole Northern Hemisphere, including on the island where I've been studying these um, common guillemots or common murs, and also in other parts of Sweden uh, way back. And these birds are really quite special. Uh, they are the oldest of all birds we have in Sweden and uh, perhaps also in Europe. And this used to be the record bird in Sweden, 43 years old. Uh, but now we have one of 47 years old actually in our colony. I think among, among the 10 record individual birds in Sweden, all of them are common murs from our colony in, in Strakalsa. And they are really good divers. They are the deepest diving of any flying birds. So penguins can dive deeper, but for flying birds, they are, have the record. They can dive down to 100 meters, uh, these birds, and they use the wings to actually swim in the water. They fly under the surface. And they breed in these large colonies. And in Sweden, the largest colony is the island of Stora Karlsö, that is west of Gotland in the Baltic Sea with a population of around 20,000 birds, uh, 20,000 individuals, and they breed on the cliffs, uh, like on this uh, picture. They're actually staying their whole lives usually within the Baltic Sea. So they are around Gotland in the summer, and then they swim around and fly around uh, the Baltic coast, and then return to 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 lay their eggs on, on Strakals again. So they're usually never leaving uh, the Baltic Sea, actually. And the thing with seabirds is that they are in the top of the food chain. So uh, in a very simplified form, uh, marine food web consists of something like four levels. We have the phytoplankton, the, the primary production on the bottom, and these algae are eaten by zooplankton, and the zooplankton are eaten by fish, and then the seabirds are eating fish. And also there are cod eating fish and, and other predatory fishes, seals, etc. And by studying 
these birds and by studying top predators in marine ecosystems we can learn about what is happening in these lower trophic levels they can be a type of indicators or temperature uh, uh, givers for for ocean ecosystem dynamics and i've been studying this uh, uh, seabirds now on Stracalse, this large colony for about 20 years actually and we've been studying them with traditional techniques such as observations noting things in in notebooks using binoculars uh, catching chicks putting rings on the chicks looking next year if they return and survive uh, etc but some years back we realized that we're not coming so much further with this. We need some more detailed uh, possibilities to study these birds and also without uh, disturbing them. So we came up with a relatively crazy idea of building a giant nest box. So this is the called the Oak Lab under construction. It's located in the middle. Uh, it's a steel construction uh, located in the middle of the colony and it has kind of, yeah, it's, it's placed like this, near the lighthouse on Strakalse. Uh, this is about 50 meters above sea level. So the beach is, is down here. And it's constructed in uh, two parts. So the inner part is the researcher's hut where we can and uh, put equipment and we can be down there, we can look out and, and here are the birds sitting and these birds do not build nests. So they lay their eggs directly on the cliffs. So what we wanted to do is to, to mimic how the natural cliffs look like and do something that would be appealing to them. So this is limestone cliffs, just as in the natural colony. And actually without forcing them, birds started moving in uh, to this <laughs> structure already the first year uh, we had it out there. So now uh, the birds can look at us uh, on a close distance as this bird is doing. And the other one is looking at the neighbors, I think on the other side of this wall. But more importantly for this talk, we can actually look at the birds. So uh, <laughs> either through manual observations or through um, uh, CCTV cameras and, and the rest of, of um, uh, this talk will, will be all about these CCTV cameras that we put up in this uh, Oak Lab and what type of information we can get from them. Um, we have multiple of them. Uh, they are connected over 4G. We don't have a fiber cable to, to this island, unfortunately, but they're connecting over 4G to an, to an app. So I can actually sit in my office in, in Lysekil and, and look at what, what these birds are doing in real time. And one of the first thing we, we wanted to do, uh, I mentioned, I think, uh, already uh, that we were collaborating with WWF on this and they are interested in, in, in kind of getting, getting the, they think these birds are a good way to get a message across uh, about ecosystems, a Baltic Sea and, and what is happening. And because they're, they're cute and they can uh, uh, tell a lot of information also on the ecosystem. So we put up a live stream on the WWF website where we made a quite simple um, uh, just uh, citizen science interface where people could report if they report, uh, see, saw any chicks or if they saw any mating activity or carrying a fish and they could also comment when they were saw. So this was going on live uh, for about four weeks in 2019 uh, continuously. And we got actually already at this first pilot stage uh, some quite sensible observations, uh, we think. So this is just a number of observations on the y-axis and the timeline on the x-axis, showing from the start where we put up these cameras, how many copulations 
we see it's going down over the season quite naturally because towards the end it's no point of copulating you won't have time to raise your chicks uh, at this point whereas the number of chicks uh, seemingly yeah there are some observations here in the beginning that are actually faulty we know that because the first chick came this day but it's, it's actually uh, at least a jump in the number of observations for that day and this was the day the last day of chicks on the ledge and then they left and then these are also faulty observations uh, down, down here but already with this kind of relatively simple interface we could get some first preliminary um, insights on, on, on what it can give us and we had a quite massive interest for this so this was maybe the most uh, the coolest thing so we had around 2000 unique observations uh, uh, during these uh, first weeks and I think around 15,000 viewers so most viewers did not submit an observation, but just looked at the video uh, for some time. Uh, there will be, uh, so we're in spring now, we're in April. Uh, in May, the first eggs will come for this year's, and we will actually launch a new live stream and citizen science interface around June 5th. So stay tuned, uh, check out the WWF uh, website or Twitter, and I'm sure you will hear about this uh, again, in case you're interested. But uh, we did not only live stream this video, we of course recorded all the material uh, as well. And from one camera only generated over 2000 hours of video data at 25 frames per second. And obviously, if you want to go through this in, real, in, in kind of the same time, it will take you 2000 hours. And maybe you want to stop and record something and it will take even more. It's basically unrealistic to to analyze this yourself. You have to rely on kind of small snapshots of time. So we were interested in exploring how whether artificial intelligence algorithms could help us analyze the data. And the first steps we were interested in was to identify parents, chicks and eggs, and also reveal behaviors and, and seasonal changes uh, for, uh, for these birds. So to that end, we arranged a hackathon uh, with uh, a number of partners, most importantly, the AI Innovation of Sweden, located at Chalmers in, in Gothenburg, but with multiple other partners as well, both as organizers, as collaborators, and as uh, technology partners. Um, and as all of you who have been working with AI knows, uh, in order, I mean, computers do not learn about themselves we have to teach them what to look for and the first step there in this case with video data is to annotate so we we actually kind of teach the computer to recognize birds so what this uh, shows here is the annotation procedure where we actually uh, note all the chicks with green uh, squares in this case and all the adult birds with uh, with uh, purple squares, and we did this quite extensively, but around around eighteen fifty annotated images, around twelve thousand birds in total, uh, to to teach this uh, algorithm in development. And then we arranged this hackathon at Lindholmen in in Gothenburg in November two thousand and nineteen. These are just some images uh, from from our us in the researcher in the seabird research group interacting with many of the participants uh, in this uh, hackathon competition and and some insights uh, from 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 this hackathon because a hackathon is is becoming a quite popular thing to do i think to 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 explore things uh, with uh, with ai is that we had some quite specific tasks that we defined. We want to, you to develop an AI that could identify chicks, for example. And, and it is good, it's often recommended when you arrange a hackathon to have be quite specific. But it's also very important, I think, to be aware of differences in background knowledge and to have some kind of inclusive, uh, to build an inclusive 
atmosphere around it. Because we had some uh, teams that developed things that were way beyond our expectations and, and other teams that have had difficult to get started, even though they had a good education background in technology. So, so, so this is one insight. See it more as a joint learning activity uh, and reciprocal between the kind of, in our, in this case, biologists or ecologists and, and data scientists uh, and, and others. Ensure expert involvement is a quite important part, I think. Um, to have coaches, both we had ecological coaches, we had a few technology coaches as well. Uh, it's also a much better way to make it interesting, a learning experience. The sum is bigger than the part. It's not about the winner, it's about what everyone does uh, within these days. So focus on collaboration instead of competition. Um, these are just some, some of my insights from this hackathon. But with that said, uh, we, we had a, a, a general winner in, in this competition as well, which was a, a team called the Sky Roads. They worked on uh, both. Uh, now I will not talk so much about the citizen. We had a citizen science part in this hackathon as well, but I will focus on the AI part. And they developed a very strong AI solution uh, to uh, analyzing these data. And this is in short what it builds on. And I'm not a technical expert to show all the details here, but, but here is the bird ledge with the video. Uh, they used the YOLO3 uh, object detection algorithm so to identify these birds. And then they used a type of tracking algorithm so to look at frame by frame in the video so, so you could actually follow one bird uh, and then and then some other parts that we can come back to if you want. But, but uh, as I said, I'm, I'm not the AI person in this case. But this is a little bit more understandable and how it looks like. So this is actually uh, the model they developed. The squares uh, obviously are the identified birds by the AI. The numbers uh, about the birds is the track ID, so it's the bird ID. We can track how long time a bird is staying on the ledge, for example, until it leaves again. Then you have some small blue boxes here that are actually chicks that are identified. So we have three classes here. We have eggs, chicks, and adults. And then this red uh, round here is what we defined as a territory. And the number you see here is how much this bird, number eight, overlaps with this territory. So it's a way to or it's an effort to try to understand if this is one of the birds that have the egg, or is it just a random bird in, in this location? Um, and this running this object detection and target tracking, I, I mentioned earlier, it's 25 frames per second, and we have two months of data. So it creates a huge data set. The video material to start with was around two terabytes, but just the object detection results when we do it on quite low sample rates, we, uh, when we only do one second, one frame per second is still many, many gigabytes, uh, just the CSV files with the time and the location of all the bounding boxes basically within this. And I'll show you some of the results from this. So, here we have the ledge again. The blue here is the shape of the ledge. We have time here uh, at, one, at this ledge called the Farallon 3. And we have the birds moving around uh, like this. And it start, it's not completely random, as you can see. It starts to, to become some, some, some patterns here that some birds are staying at certain spots and so on. And integrated over a whole two month season, it, it looks like this. Uh, so this is kind of density of, of uh, bird, adult bird positions. You can start, it, it's, emer it's emerging the, basically the territories here. One, two, three, here is maybe four, five, six, seven uh, on this ledge. Uh, even clearer when you start looking at the chicks, then you see that this pair in the middle here, they actually failed to raise a chick. Uh, 
uh, but this one was successful, this one was successful, this one and this one and this one. So it it's, uh, kind of makes sense uh, what we're seeing. Breaking this down a little bit over time, um, we get something like this. This is uh, day of the season from early May until uh, middle of July. This is number of detected chicks. And as you can see, uh, there are some detections here in the beginning, but but they start to come something uh, around here in in uh, middle of, of June. And if you remember, I showed earlier a graph of what citizen from the citizen science interface on the same camera actually, what and their chic detections, and they look like this. So in this case, the first chick was in 50, 15th of June. It's it's this uh, uh, it's this bar here, so so it almost appears that citizens were a little better at identifying the chicks at the very early stage of the breeding season. The chicks are quite difficult to see when they have just left the egg because they're very small and often hid hidden under the parents, and it could be that the citizens are having sharper eyes almost, at least than our current AI. But then, as you see, the, the, the numbers of chick sightings increase over time as, as, um, uh, as the season progresses and as the chicks move around more uh, on the ledge. And here they disappear because they jump from the ledges and then we don't have any observations, not from the AI and just a few sporadic faulty observations from the citizen scientists. Um, another thing, uh, these are the squares, the identifying the individual birds and the individual chicks. And we could also look at things like the size of the squares. Um, and it, this is also time, same time series from early May until July, beginning of July, with the size of the bounding boxes for adults in red and chicks. In blue. And here you see something that I find quite interesting. Um, as I said already, these observations on chicks in the beginning are basically faulty observations. There were no chicks at the time, and it's relatively few. But here there's starting to be many chicks, and the bounding boxes getting bigger and bigger because of the chicks are growing, uh, of course. So it's actually a it's actually a technique. Uh, as a biologist, you would think that you need to catch a chick and uh, weigh it and put it back to know how it grows. But maybe we can use the AI here to to look at chick growth and compare between seasons and compare between pairs and individuals as a very non-intrusive uh, method to to learn more about these birds. And of course, this is just one example uh, where endless opportunities to learn about these birds with these technologies without them uh, even noting, noticing us. Um, so AI offers new tools to understand the ocean through the eyes of seabirds. We can use, uh, take advantage of their position here in the top of the food web to learn more about uh, how much effort is spent to, to catch fish, which could be an indicator for how much fish there is, etc, uh, etc. Et and and with, with these new tools at hand, uh, our opportunities really expand uh, dramatically. But we also want to know better about these part of the ecosystems down here. And, and to this end, we've also in parallel started working with a marine drone, a sailing drone, um, he, the middle of this map here is actually the colony, the Stracalsa colony. So we're sailing with this drone now back and forth to monitor the amount of fish in the water column, as well as water temperature and, and other oceanographic parameters. And this little graph down here shows the 24 hours of sailing with this little boat, the sea floor here going down a little bit, and some colors here that indicates actually how much fish there is and at which depth you will find fish at different times. 
and linking this to how the seabirds fly, go where they go and how deep they uh, dive and so on gives very neat and unique opportunities to, to study this ecosystem. So to conclude, uh, I believe we can say that AI can actually revolutionize uh, seabird monitoring. But we have to keep in mind that it's a long-term investment. There's a lot, we've spent so much time on model development, on annotation, on testing models, on validation. It's just starting to get, get to the point now, I think, when we start really benefiting from, from all the work we invested in this. And citizen science could be a possible way to validate and annotate, but I think it's important to make it fun and, and meaningful and useful also for the citizen science, citizen scientists, not only a, a kind of a cheap labor, but something that is reciprocal and, and it gives them a learning experience as well. And, and as many of you know, this field of citizen science, uh, not at least within biology and ecology, is, is uh, expanding rapidly. There's this portal, Suniverse, there is many um, projects. One famous one is the Penguin Watch. We are asked to look at pictures like this and put points on every penguin here. To me, I, I don't think this is fun enough actually to, to invest in. I think we have to have a more kind of linkages between uh, uh, kind of what this gives and, and uh, what type of results you can get out from it and better feedback to the citizens. But, but um, this is a discussion that will be interesting to have with you uh, as well. And now lastly, uh, soon, there will be the feed starting again, uh, a live feed where you can take still images. You can choose what you see. You can write some comments and you can submit it. And this will end up in a database that we can re uh, later analyze and hopefully even in conjunction with the AI to, to still um, learn more about these birds. So stay tuned uh, with WWF, will come out soon, uh, hopefully. And with that said, I, I want to thank you for listening and a special thanks to some people at the AI Innovation of Sweden, Sheetal Reddy, who was the uh, main person developing all the AI for this. She was part of this team at the hackathon and is now a, a ploy, employed at AI in Gothenburg. Johanna Bergman and Vanya Kalien and Ebba Lindqvist have been instrumental as well. And then we have my colleagues, Seabird colleagues, Agnes Olin, Pia Berglund, Arne Heidström, Olof Olsson and others at the Baltic Seabird Project, uh, working with kind of everything uh, around this from data collection to analysis and results. And then uh, some other partners that I've mentioned already. So thank you so much for listening. And, um, Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Jonas. Yeah, this is a project, as you say, it's long-term investment and efforts, but it's so amazing what your team has, has been doing, yeah. So any question from our audience? I, I have one. Yeah, please. Thanks. Thank you uh, so much, Yashin and, and Jonas, for organizing this. It's super. It's been so interesting following. Um, and Jonas, I had a question related to um, when you were talking about the hackathon and the differences in the backgrounds. And I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on that. You said some teams did really, really well, while others team, teams did less well, even though they had a technical background. I was wondering if you could do you have any more insights into why you saw that difference and what a, potentially one could do to, you know, yeah, to reduce the differences in the future so that everybody's making a, yeah, big jumps? I, I think that the, the major, major challenges as an organizer for, for a hack, hackathon is to identify different tasks that are useful uh, but not too difficult, uh, uh, so so that everyone, even with a more less knowledge, can do something and contribute something, and then 
that can potentially add to other things and and where where the sum is being bigger than the parts so because to me it was extremely difficult on beforehand to 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 know how difficult is this uh, and 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 looking back i would probably have spent more time with tech experts early on to really kind of discuss through these different tasks in detail and um, and also and then the other part obviously is is have more kind of teaching and coaching as part of the hackathon to to really help people get started because this is i mean if you if you sign up for a thing like this you you decide to to spend two days uh, working on this and then it's just too difficult and you you don't kind of make any progress it's a it's very sad i think because everyone who came there were really keen on this but but uh, for some it was more much more difficult than others good input So, oh, Jonas, uh, thanks for an uh, interesting uh, presentation. I'm Felix Vaughn with the University of Gothenburg. And I, I was intrigued by this, uh, the graph you showed on the growth of the chicks. And you pointed to that and you, you said, you know, normal routines is we measure them and we weigh them, et cetera, et cetera. So I wonder, you know, have you been able to, to see how what the AI does resonates with your traditional growth models? Yeah. Yeah, it's very linear here. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a very good question. I I discovered this pattern two days ago. <laughs> I should tell you. So so uh, so uh, I haven't spent much time at all, kind of scrutinizing this. But it's a it's a very good. I think there are a few things I could say. Uh, would be very nice and interesting to to link it to growth, some type of growth model. Um, it would be interesting to, to to look whether this is um, partly also behavior because because when when the chicks are kind of young they're often just uh, just being very tight to the parents and and as they getting older they move around much more and and getting more uh, kind of uh, uh, yeah mobile on the ledge and that affects also the kind of size estimation from the AI, I think. So I, I think there are multiple things going in here. Um, uh, I'm, I'm curious to start digging into it, but I'm afraid I have no kind of definite answers uh, at this point. But but I guess what we should do is to, I mean, perhaps use a model, but also start validating this with empirical data to, to actually do weight some chicks at different times of the season and then, and then compare to kind of tune tune this model better. Thanks. So this is Håkan Sparman. Uh, I have a question. Have you had an uh, analyze of the food, the, this what species of fish the muir is eating and how this relates to the breeding success? Um, yes, we we do look at what they're eating that that's actually one one of the things where we think we could potentially use the ai in the future also to identify feedings and and perhaps even identify different species of fish that they're bringing in the bill but we haven't tried that so far so but we have done manual classic ecological observations for for many years of this and 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 they're feeding the chicks primarily on, with small clupids. So it's sprat and herring and primarily sprat. So, so average size is around 11 centimeters of the prey fish uh, that they feed to the chicks. Uh, and sprat and herring together stands for more than 95% uh, of the fish they're eating actually. Then uh, just a, a side note is that it's not necessarily so that the adults eat the same fish as they feed the chicks. So the, the common guillemots have this special thing that they have, they can just bring one fish at once uh, to the chick. So if you have seen these pictures of puffins that have 20 fish on the, on the side of the beak, 
then they can have take like many small fish rather than one big fish but but the, the guillemots you they they prefer to take one big fish but it could be that when they self forage at sea they eat other species and then they bring one big cloopy to the chicks but that's something we we don't know perfectly at this point Another question. You said that the mur is have a very long uh, lifespan. Have one uh, done an an analyzing how come? Because there must be, they must have a very strenuous life. <laughs> and how can they survive for 47 years in those environments? It's, it's amazing. It, it's, it's amazing. I, I, I think that myself, I like, I mean, spending the whole life out there in the Baltic Sea with all these threats. I mean, we're talking about uh, oil spills, we're talking about bycatch, they can be caught in fishing nets, uh, we, they used to be hunting, and, and still, we, we're actually having a new quite interesting threat at Strakalsu now with seals eating seabirds. So uh, 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 maybe not a big mortality factor, but, but we have still see it. But we, we have done, we have been ringing um, uh, or banding birds for many, many years and done survival modeling. And it turns out that they have very high survival e even in the first year. So, so their, their annual survival for the adults is over 90%, it's 95% or, or, or even more. So it seems that, and, and likely in many other systems, in many other ecosystems, the limiting factor is the prey and, and the lack of prey for some years uh, make them starve. But as Baltic Sea is quite productive at this point, and and furthermore, uh, it has become even more productive with eutrophication and so on. So uh, it seems that there is enough fish at least for them, and then I think they can survive for a long time. Obviously. Thank you, Jonas. Uh, Jonas, can I ask you a question? Um, can you say something more about uh, how do you use the annotations from citizens for the algorithm? Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't done that at all uh, yet. Okay. So uh, it would be, we have been discussing it actually. Uh, for the citizens now, we do, um, they can point at things they see in the frame and then it's saved at the position and as something. And what we've been thinking of mainly is to use the citizen science um, annotation, uh, if you want to call them that, to, to, to uh, discover rare behaviors. Uh, because there are, uh, I mean, AI, to develop an AI for something, you need a lot of training data. Mm -hmm. and, and, and finding many pictures with birds and just making squares around them is not so difficult. But when it comes to kind of, we, we've been interested in, in identifying behavior like fights, for example. And mm -hmm. then it would be quite nice to, every time a citizen scientists see a fight, they point out here is a fight. And then we can build up a fight annotation data set that we can later try on the AI to see if it can identify other fights. So, so that, that's how we've been reasoning around this. Um, but I guess, uh, yeah. And for example, do you provide the kind of protocol to citizens to, um, to annotate things, to, <clears throat> to help them guide what they need to see? Or, or just you let, let them free to annotate whatever they see uh, in the way they want to? Yeah, we, we do have a number of cat uh, predefined categories that we are interested in, uh, in terms of behaviors. Uh, then we have provided some instruction videos, uh, 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 exemplifying these behaviors, um, but that's about it. And, um, and I guess, so one example would be that one thing we actually discovered uh, when we put up these cameras is that a few hot days every season it's getting really, really hot in the sun. And then they're almost, I mean, they cannot cope almost these birds. And, and this is, the thing is that this, this, this will probably increase also with climate change, this type of extreme weather events. And we have had chicks dying kind of in front, 
when we are recording because of their parents cannot cope. They're leaving the ledge and they she is alone in the sun and they're basically uh, dying of uh, overheat. So and and these type of behaviors. So we we've, we've we've been trying to put together a type of small library of examples showing that this this is how it looks like when a, a, a seabird is suffering from overheat. And then if you see this, please uh, make a note and, and submit that observation. But I think it's it's a it's a little bit limited. Also, I mean, I, I think you could. You could have some very advanced citizen scientists that you would kind of. Uh, it, it's a little bit parallel to the to the discussion we had on the hackathon. Actually, some could could help us. They could be almost like research assistants, and, and for all types of of uh, uh, information. And for others, and I think many of our viewers are people with little expertise on on seabirds and little expertise on ecology finding this stream, they think it's interesting, they're looking a little bit, they may submit one or two observations uh, that they think is interesting. And, and there is a limit, I think, how much you can ask for in a sense. Um, so so I, I, uh, and that boils down to the, what type of group we're doing this for, uh, of course. And it could be multiple at the same time maybe, but uh, just curious there, I mean, this in regards of, of annotations, wouldn't that be an opportunity to link the citizen science part and the AI part? Because, I mean, in natural, natural, natural language processing, etc. And that could maybe address what you, what I think you're after here as well, you know, motivation. How, how do you actually motivate citizen science not just to do uh, one thing or two, but to keep going? And, and either you are dedicated by soul or maybe paid to do it, and then you, you're persistent. But if you're not, then you need things to change. You need to have a new reason to go there, a new, new reason to keep going. And maybe the AI could be one of the solutions there. You know, it's, it's improving. It changes. The tasks you get change over time, etc. cetera. The, the annotations result in something that comes back. It, it's a very nice perspective, actually. I haven't thought about it in, in that way, but it's a, it's a great comment. So Jonas, is there any way to discern the difference between male and female MERS? Uh, not visually. Uh, okay. Um, but we've- so It's just by behavior. Yeah. But another thing, I mean, generally they're quite difficult to distinguish so so in, in in this little picture we have down here i know that for example the one in the right corner and the one sitting next to it to it it's number eight and ten i think they they are the male and the female of that pair for sure i can see that from the kind of position how they're standing and so on but what would you, we know we would like to know who's the male and who's the female and and perhaps we we've been speculating if we get this target tracking working properly, maybe they have individual kind of movement patterns yeah. that we can use to, to, uh, to distinguish between individuals within pa one pair, for example. Yeah. But we haven't come that far yet. Okay. So. Are, are, the, um, are the birds distinct enough that you could possibly actually follow individuals, not just as with object tracking, but a bird going away and then coming back again and seeing it's the same individual as another one, or are they two alike? To, I don't. I mean, I I don't. I I should not say no because because there are there is a very nice study in um, about great tits that actually they they um, identified with object detection individuals uh, that and that kind of the human eye couldn't distinguish. So uh, who knows? But I'm. I, I think, yeah, yeah. I have a great possible. tip that comes to my window here that I recognise, but that's because he's missing a left eye. So that's <laughs> okay. <an> outlier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. I have a question, Jonas. So you mentioned that 
It seems the birds which are like at the corner side, they are successful in leaving their chicks. But those in the middle, <laughs> a bit unlucky. Um, yeah. Do you know why? Um, in this year, I'll try to remember. Um, I think they are an ex inexperienced couple. So, so one thing with with these birds is that they're they're learning how to kind of uh, the learning family life over the years in, in a sense. So, so actually, the first time they lay the first they lay their first egg when they're around five years old. So, the years until five years is just practice, uh, basically. And then usually the first attempt is also not successful. So, so it could be, I'm not sure in this case, but I, I, I'm pretty sure that it was an inexperienced pair actually that did some mistake. Usually they do mistakes. It's just a, they just uh, happen to kick the egg out from the ledge or something like that. Um, but, but it could have been also, yeah, let me think. It could have been heat actually last year that it was a very very warm day when it tried to move around the egg and then the egg fall out but it's um yeah either either that or experience or a combination of the two and in this pro project you have the data collection the annotation and the model developing. So if we generally divide this project into these three phases, um, which part would you say is the most challenging? Um, I think we, <laughs> I, I, I think it has going up and down for me, my kind of mood in this project because it started off like a rocket and it was amazing. And I, I had like, I could never expect something like this. But then you're starting scrutinizing in detail and then you find out that, yeah, well, in order to answer this question, I need to have an accuracy that is not 98%. I need 99.9% .9 for certain aspects. And then to kind of tune it in order to get that level of, of, of certainty about uh, things have been the most challenging, I think. So one example here is with this uh, target tracking. So, so I didn't show many examples of target tracking today of the simple reason that it has been very, very difficult to get working. So this is just, you, I mean, you see the clock up here, it's time 10.33. And within this frame, the algorithm manages to, to follow these birds. So this is bird number 11. It's many frames, it's 25 per second, but it, it remembers the bird. It's still number nine, and this is still number 10. But if a bird spent, yeah, there it changes actually, this, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. Yeah, well, um, what happens is that we want to follow a bird from the arrival to it departs again, and it could be six hours later. And then it's, <laughs> Just one mistake of the algorithm, uh, mixing up two birds, will ruin it, ruin the whole data set in a sense. So these type of getting getting the precision that high as it, so so it's useful for us. That that has been the main challenge, I think. So you are saying that sometimes um, maybe one manner problem with the algorithm, like couldn't mix certain birds when tracking them in one frame, and that can kind of spoil the complete data. Yeah, yeah, it spoil, yeah it spoils a lot. Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. That, 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 that I think has been one of the main, and I, that's something I, here, here is one such example. Here's a new bird coming in, and it's total mess of birds in there. And I think when, it, when they walk it out again, many of them have actually changed track IDs in this case. Uh, mm -hmm. Because it's, uh, and it, I mean, it's even hard for the human eye. You have to look many times to see, to see what, what is happening here. But, uh, but still, it's, it's, 
for you can go back. I mean, I can go back and watch the video again, but the AI is running once and then you get an answer. And if it's the wrong answer, it's uh, unfortunate. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Just to, to challenge you a bit, Jonas, there with this. Uh, you know, I mean, I can very much identify with this, you know, uh, initial, uh, you know, you see the opportunities and then you realize it can't fully deliver. But don't that, to, to a large extent, has to do with the fact that uh, we all try to adopt new methods to answer existing questions, if you see what I mean. You know, it, it, you compare them with methods that we have fine-tuned for many, many years. Mm -hmm. uh, and this uh, new stuff is not built for these questions. So, I mean, another approach would be to, to next, in the next round, launch a hackathon with a purpose to generate new questions. So we have this thing. We want to learn about these birds. What new questions can we actually answer with these methods? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think you're completely right. And I mean, that, that's the major challenge as, as a scientist to ask the right questions. <laughs> and we, and we have a tendency to ask the same questions over and over again. Uh, so, so I think you're completely right. And, and that's, I mean, that, that's the whole uh, benefit of interdisciplinary collaborations and hackathons and so also to, to get this new perspective. And, and I think we have got a lot of new questions also uh, from, from, from kind of non-ecologist and non-biologist engaging in this, but, but, but exactly, you're, uh, you're totally right, and uh, and that would be quite fun actually, to to do something like that, to to have a flip it a little bit around uh, for another hackathon. Great idea. Thanks. Eunice, when you are sharing, I'm thinking like once you spot a problem of the algorithms, is it possible? I mean, in some sense, that human interact with AI. Like, is it possible that you or the engineer tell the algorithm, okay, you're making a mistake? And then, yeah. So maybe yeah. some, I'm not sure, maybe some AI experts here also, yeah. Is it yeah. possible? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm probably not uh, the right <laughs> person <laughs> to ask this because I'm, I'm better at identifying errors than solving errors in this case. <laughs> but that's also very important, yeah. So maybe that's a question, I mean, about how human and AI, we kind of interacting, even in this at the algorithm level, maybe, yeah. Mm. Okay. Could be, yeah. yeah. I think people are dropping off uh, a little bit. I see some comments yeah. in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Which is great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you all for joining the webinar today. And thank you so much, Jonas, for this very interesting and inspiring sharing. And we have the recording, and we will see how we could um, share this webinar. Yeah. OK. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And feel free to touch thank me. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Uh, and Bye. by the way, we have Thank you. another Bye -bye. sharing uh, webinar on April 30th about law, ocean relevant law, and how that may influence our uh, way doing research. Yeah. So welcome to join the webinar on April 30th as well. Thank you so much. Have a nice afternoon. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Hello, Yushin. Hi, Tushin. <laughs>